happy little games. Punk. Hello fellow Batman fans, Batman QC here once again to discuss the various games of Batman Returns. So far, we've knocked down two and today we are focusing on Sega's 16-bit home outing. Since the Sega CD version has the original cartridge game built in, I decided to merge these two videos into one. So let's check this game out and discuss the history of Batman Returns for the Sega Genesis and Sega CD. The story of Batman and how he came to be associated with Sega started with two people. The first person being the self-anointed King of Pop and the other just a flat out superhero. Michael Jackson had been a longtime fan of video games, especially ones designed by Sega. He co-developed the Sega arcade game Moonwalker in all of its home versions, which were based on the film of the same name. Jackson would later go on to write music for Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and also appeared in the games Space Channel 5, Part 1 and 2, and also Ready to Rumble Boxing, among others. He also enjoyed comic books, with his favorites being, in particular, Spider-Man and Batman. He was a huge fan of the Spider-Man arcade game and owned an actual cabinet in his collection. Speaking of his collection, he also owned a Batman arcade game as well as a life-size Batman statue. But instead of Michael Keaton in the costume, it was actually Michael Jackson. While visiting Sega of Japan in December of 1988, he had urged Sega to pursue the Batman license for the upcoming 1989 Tim Burton film. At this point, Batman was an unproven commodity on the big screen since the film's release date was still six months away. Sega essentially drugged their feet waiting too long while Japanese developer Sunsoft snatched the license up and released home versions, including one on the Sega Genesis hardware. During the summer of 1991, Sega was able to secure a limited license for Batman Returns for release in all of their home systems. The reason the license was limited was because they were allowed to use only one publicity photo from the movie on all of their packaging and manuals. This is why the game uses the same photo of the three main characters on each of the boxes and also why there are no digitized stills from the movie in the game. There was a pack-in poster that featured Michael Keaton, but it wasn't available in all regions. The Sega CD version did include some nice lion art, but these were not digitized stills from the movie. The cartridge version was handed off to developer Acme Interactive, who wanted to create an action platformer to take full advantage of the 16-bit hardware. It must have taken extra special blast processing power to create a game this purple because that is primarily the only color you will see. The sprites are large and well animated and the game is very fast. As the story goes, Batman is chasing the penguin towards the top of a building. At the very top, the Ice Princess is being held captive. The Penguin unleashes a flurry of bats which knocks her off, making it appear as if Batman has pushed her, making him Gotham's enemy number one. The cartridge game, which was released first in late 1992, features five levels with plenty of Batman action. You have the usual assortment of punches, standard kicks, and blow kicks at your disposal. You do get to play with some gadgets in your utility belt this time around, including the grappling hook, which is great for gaining access to upper ledges. It's also useful for swinging across large gaps. The animation on the rope itself is fantastic and silky smooth. You can also raise or lower yourself on the grappling hook for dramatic Batman effect. The other weapons you can pull out of your utility belt are batarangs, smoke bombs that will instantly freeze an enemy in which you can finish them off, a deadly swarm of bats that will go right for the face of the enemy, the grapple gun which will shoot a long thin electrified wire, and super seeking batarangs which can seek and knock out multiple enemies if they are all grouped together. There are a few power-ups in the game including small hearts which will restore a small amount of health, large hearts which restores all of your health, and a mirror which will grant you an extra life. 
you have various weapon refills all throughout the levels. Batman has a very cool glide feature which can only be used in short doses. There is a glide meter on the HUD letting you know how much time you have left. The soles of Batman boots can protect you from dangers such as fire and electricity. There is an element of strategy in the game which you will need because Batman moves rather stiff compared to the enemies. It seems as if he is moving just a little bit slower than everything else. Certain bosses such as Catwoman early on require just punches and timed attacks to defeat, while others require the more powerful weapons for you to have a shot. This game is brutally difficult, even more so than the Atari Lynx version reviewed in the last episode. The platforming gets nuts, especially in level 3 which involves the Ferris wheel. The graphics are very detailed and yes there is a lot of purple but the sprites don't blend into the background all that often. You do end up fighting some of the same circus freaks found on the big screen but they decided to throw in stone gargoyles that come to life. Everything is well defined and moves along at a rapid pace. There are a couple of animated cutscenes but nothing in this version that uses the actual actors likenesses. The music and sound effects sound great and really remind me of Revenge of Shinobi. The five levels you will experience are Gotham City, Shrek's Wonderland, The Red Triangle Circus. Into the Sewers. And the Penguin's Lair. There are many bosses at the end of each stage, including Catwoman, Twin Statues, The Penguin, Strong Man, the second encounter with Catwoman, the Rolling Clown Team. Assassin Clown The Penguin's Bright Yellow Duck The Final Encounter with the Penguin Finally, the last encounter with Catwoman. Thankfully, you can adjust some of these options giving you extra lives or more health. There are two different endings in the game, a bad one in which Catwoman defeats Batman, and the good ending in which Batman defeats Catwoman where she is eaten alive by cats and all is right with the world. In 1993, Sega released Batman Returns for the Sega CD system. 
When the Sega CD add-on was announced, I was excited beyond belief. After waiting in line for 12 hours, the very first game I purchased was... Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch Make My Video. The second game was Batman Returns. Being a huge racing game fan, the Batmobile and Bat Ski Boat sections looked incredible with graphics that looked like they belonged in an arcade. This isn't just a cartridge game with Redbook audio tacked on. It does take full advantage of the Sega CD's advanced capabilities. The platforming sections from the Genesis version have been brought over mostly intact, although the sound effects have been cleaned up considerably. The vehicle sections of the game use a behind-the-vehicle viewpoint similar to Batman the Movie on the Amiga and Batman Returns on the Super Nintendo. There are five driving levels or acts with six stages in each. Three with the Batmobile and two with the Bat Ski Boat. You clear a stage by defeating all the enemies or passing the obstacles and then move on to the next. Your vehicle is equipped with rapid-fire machine guns and heat-seeking missiles which will home in on the nearest target. For some strange reason, you have to push down on the D-pad for your brakes. You also have a turbo button to get a little more oomph on those big jumps. The object of each racing section is to get to the end of the level before the time runs out taking out any cars that are in the way. At the end of each level is a boss vehicle which needs to be destroyed similar to the arcade game Chase HQ. There are obstacles aplenty to avoid as well including gasoline bombs. Various trash cans litter the road that have a flashing signal indicating they have missiles inside to replenish your supply. Enough can't be said about the extraordinary graphics especially for its time. The scaling and rotation are definitely next generation. The Red Book Audio is utterly fantastic and makes a pretty good platform game so much better in my opinion. The music was composed by Spencer Nielsen who also worked on such Sega CD games as Echo the Dolphin, The Amazing Spider-Man vs. Kingpin, and Sonic CD. Unfortunately, it's not Danny Elfman's score but it does provide plenty of rocking tunes. There is a new animated opening which shows off the scaling and rotation features as well as updated continue screens and a new ending. No full motion video, unfortunately, although we do get some nice artwork of Danny DeVito as the Penguin. Even the option screen has been given a facelift. You have the option of playing only the driving levels, only the platform sections, or the combined game which can be completed in about an hour and a half. I've already showcased the platform sections, but I would like to show off a few levels with the new music, so here we go. The five brand new driving sections include Streets of Gotham, Winter Wonderland, City Limits,
sewers of Gotham, in which you get to drive the bat ski boat, making perilous jumps all the while bobbing and weaving like a prize fighter. And finally, the penguin's lair. The vehicle controls are nice and tight, but it is difficult due to the limited amount of time that you have to complete each stage. It is true there weren't that many must-buy games for the Sega CD, but if you were a fan of Batman and racing games and were also willing to shell out $300 for the add-on, then this was definitely a must-buy. I hope you enjoyed Part 3 on the history of Batman Returns. Stay tuned for Part 4 coming soon. Same Pat time, same Pat channel. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you so much for watching.